Good morning. Glad to be here with you guys this fine morning. Uh, I will be reading from the uh, bulletin, page three, I believe it is, our catechism question. Leader, who is the Redeemer? The only Redeemer is the Lord Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, in whom God became man and bore the penalty for sin himself. Uh, I will also be reading from 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 5 and 6. If you will uh, turn to your Bible and read that with me, please. <clears throat> uh, starting in uh, verse 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. If you will uh, close your eyes and pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this beautiful day, for this opportunity for all of us as a church to gather together under one roof and read your Bible, read your word, praise and worship and glorify you, Lord. Let us never forget that that is the purpose of life. I know there's a lot of question about why we're here, what is our purpose, what should we, we be spending our time on? What should we be spending our days on? Well, it's quite simple, actually, to glorify you, to praise and worship you, and to minister to others and share that purpose with others. Um, help us to be doing that in a manner of rejoicing and positiveness. Uh, as simple as it may sound, not everyone... Not everyone is filled with the Holy Spirit as they should be, so we need to share that in a positive and Christian manner, Lord, just like you did, just like you call us to. Um, thank you for all of our brothers and sisters in Christ, and just help us to keep, ev keep every one of us in prayer and always be there for our Christians and for our Christian brothers and sisters as we are for our neighbors. Uh, amen. Let's all stand together and sing, There is a Redeemer. Let's all stand.
I'll be reading this morning from the letter to the Ephesians. These are words that if I had to guess this morning, you've probably heard before. And there's a danger when we listen to verses that we've heard over and over again to kind of tune out. But these are the words of the Lord, written for our benefit. Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 11, we find these words. Therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and he preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, many of us in this room today have very little or no memory of life outside of the church. Some that are here in this place today have very little memory of their life before trusting in Jesus Christ. And we thank you for that. Lord, what an amazing blessing and testimony that is. And yet, Father, we are reminded by these verses that each and every one of us were born outside of all of your promises. According to our flesh, we should absolutely find nothing but condemnation when we approach you. But now, through our Savior Jesus Christ, you have drawn us near to you. And when our sin would hold us back, the very blood of Jesus Christ was poured over us that we who were filthy might be made clean. And now, Father, those that we would be at war with, including you, we are united with. When you look down, you don't see us as Jew or Gentile. When you look down, Father, it's not whether we are male or female. You see us as one church. 
drawn to you by the effective work of your Son, Jesus Christ. And so we stand here today, Father, but not on our own ideas, not on our own good works, but we stand on the foundation that was laid for us. One that was talked about by prophets. One that was defined and clarified by the apostles. That we can still see and understand because of the writings of the Holy Scriptures. All of which point us to our Savior Jesus Christ. And so, Father, we pray that you would make us one church. And when we say that, we don't just mean with those who are gathered together with us in this place. We mean one church throughout the world. One church that speaks many different languages. One church that has people of every economic status. One church that has many different skin tones. One church that will not meet in this world, but will meet in the one to come. One church bought with the very blood of Jesus Christ. So we pray, Father, forgive us for the times when we have been agents of division. Forgive us for the times where we focused more on ourselves than we focused on others. Forgive us and make us one. For we pray this in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. How firm a foundation. to go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, we know today that you know our hearts, you know our thoughts, and you know our desires. You've put them for us, and we just pray that we align those with your will in our lives. Help us to 
Love you as the only God. Love your son, Jesus Christ, who came and died for our sins. Help us to love others as we love ourselves. Help us to show that to the world and be a beacon for you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. One thing that we have all had in common is having a biological mother. Many of you have had a godly mother as well, and whether you've had a godly mother or not, uh, you may have had a godly woman in uh, your life. Um, So anyway, today as we go to the Lord uh, in prayer, we go to Him with with thankful hearts. Let's, let's go to the Lord now in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for and thankful for godly mothers and for other godly women who love you, are obedient to you, who seek to lead others to you and disciple others. May their influence continue and expand And may they lead other women to be godly women. And now, Father, as we turn our attention to 1 Corinthians, Father, I pray that you may bless the reading of and the preaching of your word now. Amen. If you would, open your Bibles and join with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Paul has just been discussing with the Corinthians, or telling them, really it's not much of a discussion when they can't answer, 
about two types of people, the spiritual person or the natural person, and how the natural person cannot understand the things of God. He does not have the ability to do so, where only the spiritual person can understand the things of God. And he picks up here in chapter 3, beginning in verse number 1. But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now you are not yet ready, for you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not being merely human? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed as the Lord assigned to each. I planted Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. According to the grace God given to me like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation. And someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. For now if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him, for God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. Now, I don't always like to admit it publicly, but babies are pretty awesome. Now, they're really awesome when I can give them back to you. All right, so let's just make sure that we're clarified on on that. And in mine, we're awesome sometimes. Right? We understand how this works. That there are moments when we see babies that we have that awe moment inside of us. It was really neat. Yesterday at our picnic, there was actually a a woman who brought her baby, and people were fighting over who got to hold the baby. And um, my mom won. She has a knack for that. But uh, later on, it was exciting to see that there was a 14 year old boy who kept pestering his mom, go ask if I can hold the baby. Go ask if I can hold the baby. And sure enough, by the time it was over, he was holding that baby, and that baby fell right asleep in his arms. And everything, I mean, it was just beautiful to watch. We do all of these things for our babies. We buy them special clothes, and we buy them particular kinds of bottles, if, you know, to make sure that they can drink the right amounts. And We buy formula or we breastfeed. There's a fight there, and let's not go into that today. But we make sure that we provide the right kinds of food because we can't just sit the baby at the table with us to eat the same things that we're eating. We would not give a delicious, medium, rare ribeye to a baby. Why would you waste such good food on a baby? Right? But the baby couldn't handle it if we did. And that's how Paul begins speaking here when he says, But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it yet. He's looking back to when he first planted the church. 
And when he was there, he's thinking about, there was a time when I came that you were all just little spiritual babies. And I didn't start out in Revelation. I didn't give you the heavy things at first. I just shared with you that basic entry-level spiritual truth, the one that fed all of us when we were babies in the faith. We, we, we grow, but when we start, man, if we can just grasp the fact of Jesus Christ and him crucified for our sins, Jesus Christ and him buried and risen again on the third day, if we could just hold on to the truth that it was a real historical event that happened for you and for me that people witnessed with their eyes and have been passed down for us. That's all that we have. And we take what we have and we begin sharing that with others. And they can ask us questions and we go, I don't know the answers to all of that, but here's what I know. Jesus Christ bled and died for me. And, and that's as far as we can go. And can I say, that's, that's good enough in that moment. It's exactly what we need to strengthen us and to nourish us, to help us to grow. But the problem is, years have passed since Paul was with the Corinthian church. And he's saying, now when I'm talking to you and I'm trying to talk to you about heavier matters and you can't handle it because you're still needing milk. You haven't grown. A little newborn infant in diapers is cute. A 14 year old in diapers is not. A baby that can only drink milk because we can't add any little oatmeal to it yet is beautiful. A 13 year old who can only drink milk is not. And Paul is looking at the church in Corinth and saying, you should be beyond, be beyond this now. You should have grown. You should be more mature than you are. But when I go to speak to you, I have to speak to you as if you're at day one. But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people. Yes, there's two people. There's the natural person and there's the spiritual person. But I couldn't talk to you on the level as a spiritual person because you're still grasping at the basics. And Paul is saying, this isn't cute. This is not a good thing. This is a bad thing that we are in this situation. Now, he does a huge grace here at the beginning and it's vital that we recognize it there in the first verse but i brothers could not address you he's not saying because you haven't grown in maturity it means you are not believers it's not saying that if you don't keep pace spiritually with everyone else then you're not truly a christian he's saying look you have that basic that makes you my brother or sister. We are family because you've held to the truth that Jesus Christ bled and died for your sin. You, you've got that, and so I call you my brother. But man, you need to grow up. But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people. Look at verse 3, for you're still of the flesh. How does he know this? Not because they didn't pass a test. He didn't give an exam to see if they'd been studying Deuteronomy. This is how he knew they weren't maturing. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? Paul says it's not that your brain hasn't been filled with the scriptures. It's that your life is not changing to look like a believer's life should look. Now, I've got to be super clear here because as Baptists, sometimes we get really scared any time somebody starts talking about works. So I've got to be just as careful as I can possibly be. Again, he starts out calling them brothers. This is not a justification issue. 
This is not an issue of whether or not they are going to heaven. He's established that they are going to heaven because they have believed the basics of Christianity. They have put their hope and trust in Jesus Christ. He started that at the beginning of the book in those few wonderful verses that he gave before he started telling them, now here's your problem. You have believed what you must believe to be a Christian. So we're not talking about that. At the same time, as a believer in Jesus Christ, there should be works that follow. And, and I'm going to use a word that, here's the word that scares me, but there must be works that follow. Not to make you saved, but because you are saved. A living creature produces things. Some of them beautiful, some of them not. But a living creature produces things, and the moment those things are not being produced, you look back and say, what's wrong that that's not following? I remember going to all of the early doctor appointments, and they would weigh the kids, and they would poke them and prod them and tap on their knees and, and measure them and do all of those things. And then at the end of the appointment, we were giving these sheets of paper that had this line on it. And here's this dark line, and then over here there's this dotted line, and then below the line there's another dotted line, and then there's bullet points all over it. And what they were saying is, this is a normal growth pattern, and here's where your child falls. And as long as you were inside the dotted lines, you got to go home and not come back for another six months. But as soon as one of those bullet points land outside of the dotted lines, they're like, we're a little concerned that this isn't going the way that it should be going. We need you to make sure that you're given a little bit more to eat or you need to stop giving quite so much to eat. And all. You need to do something to fix it because normal growth in life follows a curve. And Paul is looking at the behavior of the Corinthians and saying, your life doesn't look right for someone who confesses Jesus Christ. There's something wrong here because you are all fighting over things you ought not to be fighting about. And so he goes right to the heart of the fight. Who is Apollos? What's Paul? The answer, nothing but servants through whom you believed. And it wasn't Apollos that decided that you would be his guy. And it wasn't me that decided I'd be your guy. God assigned us to you. It's humbling for me to think that God has assigned me to y'all. Congratulations, you got me. <laughs> but do you know that God has assigned you to someone else? None of us are saved to be the end of the work. We are saved to be servants, dare I use the word, slaves of Jesus Christ, going out to do whatever he tells us to do, even when we don't feel like it. Because I can tell you there are days I don't feel like it. There are days I just want to go and hide in a room somewhere, close the door, take my phone and a book, and just ignore everything and everyone else. No, it's, it's true. That's where we go. We have those moments. But can I tell you, just as I have to preach to myself, that the fact that I don't always feel like being a servant of God doesn't change the fact that every moment of my life I am one and I'm called to serve. 
what's Apollos, what's Paul, servants through whom you believed as the Lord assigned to each. And then he goes on, I planted, Apollos watered, but here's the good news, God gave the growth. I can work all day long, but unless God does the miracle, nothing will come of it. Every week when I sit down with this, trying to find the right words to convey what God has revealed in this scripture, I do so with the full knowledge that no matter how much time I spend studying, no matter how, much, how many commentaries I read, no matter how much effort I put into it, unless the Holy Spirit does a work, it will stop at the end of your ears. But when God gets involved, it will do far more than anything I could ever try to convince any of you to do. A miracle happens when the Holy Spirit takes his word and implants it in your life. Now if that's true for me, please don't hear, I'm, I'm not up here patting myself on the back. I'm here saying, and that's the same for each and every one of you with me. That when you study the scriptures and when you, you grow them, you're not just benefiting yourself. You grow for the benefit of someone else. Because God wants to use you in your hurts and your sufferings for someone else. God wants to use those highlight moments of your life for someone else. He wants to take the darkness you've been through so that you can be an encouragement for someone else. God has got you exactly where he has you, not for you, but for someone else, all to the glory of his name. So that when you share what you've been through with someone else, and they come to you just saying, oh, thank you, you're exactly what I needed, you can say, no, you, not me. It's him that you need. All glory be to Christ. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. My great ambition in life is to ultimately, and, and this is so different from what you hear in so many places, but here, my great ambition in life is to be unknown eventually. Uh, the worst thing anybody could ever do would be name a building or put my name on a pew somewhere. I don't care if generations from now, none of my family has done research to figure out who I was. My ambition in life is to be unknown, but to make sure that my Savior is known. I'm nothing. Only God gives the growth. But verse 8, we could, that, that would stop in fatalism right there. Oh, I'm nothing. I can't really. Do, only God does anything. So I don't need to really do anything because God's going to do it with or without me. No. Paul doesn't let him do that. Verse 8, he who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. <laughs> All right. That motivates me. And people say, you know, you shouldn't be motivated by that kind of stuff. You should just have an intrinsic desire to go and do it. Well, if he didn't want me to be motivated by it, he shouldn't have put it in there. Because as soon as I see that when I do work here on earth for the sake of the name of Jesus Christ, that there's a reward at the end for it, I am a competitive person. I like Winning a lot. I had a great time this last week on, on, on a trip, and some of our state representatives, one that's there, may the Lord, but I, I'm falling in love with this guy. His name's Scooter. I mean, come on, you got to like him already, right? His name is Scooter. He wanted to know where we landed on the number of missionaries sent out when you rank the states. He wanted to know that for one reason. He wants to make sure that this year we bump up at least over the next state above us. And that eventually we're number one because he says, I want to win. I tried not to applaud, but I was like, yeah. Why? 
because there's a great reward. And here's the great thing about the reward that I know is coming for me for the work that I do here on earth. I get to take that reward and I get to lay it at the feet of Jesus Christ. That's the picture that we have in scripture. And I don't want to present this much. I want to have a wheelbarrow needed to carry the stuff I get to give back to my Savior. I want to beat y'all. All right, I'll die there. I said it. I, I want to have enough to put there that when my Savior sees that which is before him, all the glory goes to him because remember, I may have planted or I may have watered, but he gave the growth that made that happen. And he used me. The creator of the universe who only needed to speak to create the entire universe used me for his glory. I want that. I, I want it. And you're allowed to want it too. It may be that's not your ultimate motivation. And that's okay. It's, I'm not saying that has to be an ultimate motivation. But you don't get to just sit back and do nothing because spiritual beings grow and part of that growth is obedience. We will receive wages according to our labor, verse 9. For we are God's fellow workers. That, doesn't that sound funny on your ears? We're working alongside God. That's, that's crazy. That's insane. That's true. Do you know how much easier it is to do a job when the person that's working alongside you is a master in that craft? Do you know how much easier it is to do a job when the person working right next to you is the creator of the universe? See, it's not heavy labor, it's not hard. It doesn't require great skills or amazing talents. You may not have the ability to get up and, and do jumping jacks or run marathons or carry heavy boxes or do anything. You may only be able to pray. Then pray faithfully. Do that work with joy, knowing that God is there with you. Verse 10, according to the grace of God given to me like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds on it. Now we've been talking about that foundation throughout this service. He goes and points it out. No one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. This church is founded upon the truth that Jesus is the Christ. He is the Messiah who lived a sinless life, who did die on a cross to take the penalty for your sins and for my sins, that he did go into a grave and that he did walk out three days later, that that event was witnessed by many eyewitnesses and by believing in that truth, we are forgiven and we are granted eternal life. This, that is the foundation of everything that this church does. And that's where we start. And the work that we do is all built upon that singular truth. Verse 12. Now if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw. It's all going to be made known. There are a lot of things that we do with our days that have zero eternal consequence. And when the days are measured by fire, they're just gonna, those, those moments and those days of our life, they're just, they're gonna be gone. There's gonna be nothing remaining. And then there are days that our faithful obedience, our worship, our evangelism, 
brings glory to God. And when that passes through the fire, it won't go away. It will remain purified and beautiful before the sight of Almighty God. But there's a there's coming a day, as we see here. I think I stopped right before I got there. Verse 13. Each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire. All of us will stand before the judgment seat. And all of our works will be tested. And all of the nonsense, all of the stupid things we've done, and please, all the stupid things we've said, I really hope all of those are gone. We'll be burned up and there'll be nothing left. But the things done that have glorified our Savior will remain. That day is coming. And for some, when the fire is gone, there'll be nothing left. They lived for themselves. They, they never grew spiritually as they should. This verse is, is at least a little bit of hope there because notice... If the work that anyone has built, verse 14, if the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but hear this, though he himself will be saved. It's not your works that save you. So you might not have anything to show for it, but can we still say praise the Lord, you'll be there? We don't want to just be there. We want to glorify the God who saved us with the way that we live our lives. We want to glorify the God who sent his son to die on a cross by living a life that reflects that great sacrifice that was made for us. So let me ask you this. What are you doing right now to grow in your faith? When you look over your last week, was it a week that you lived unto yourself? Or was it a week that was lived to the glory of God? What are you intentionally doing to ensure and to help you grow in your spiritual walk? Do you have an Apollos or a Paul, someone who is there investing their lives in you to help you grow? Or for some of you, you don't need that. You need to be someone else's Apollos or Paul. And can I tell you what's really helpful is when you've got both. <laughs> you've got someone pouring their life into you as you simultaneously pour your life into someone else. You get really beautiful growth in yourself because I often find I've learned a lot more by teaching than I ever did by opening books and just studying on my own. By being challenged by someone else. What are you doing to make sure that you don't stay a spiritual infant, but to grow in your faith? If you don't have someone that's mentoring you and you believe that you need someone, I want you to come and share that with me. I want to help link you up with someone who would be good to help you read through the scriptures together, to, to talk together, to pray together, that you might grow because here, here's our goal. That by this time next year, you are much more mature in your faith than you are right now. That's our goal. To live a life to the glory of God the Father. Because look at the end. Don't you know that you're God's temple? Now that's a plural you. That's not just the you individual. He's, he's, so in, in Southern, don't y'all know that y'all are God's temple? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy. And you are God's temple. May God dwell in us and make us what we should be. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you that my salvation is not based on how well I did this last week. Thank you that my salvation is not based upon all the works of my hands because my hands are often filthy and don't do as they should. Thank you that my salvation is based on the perfect work of Jesus Christ 
who bled and died for my sins. But also thank you that you are willing to use me to do work to bring glory to your name. Thank you that we are fellow workers, as impossible as that may seem to us. And I pray right now for each person in this room, Lord, I pray that we each examine ourselves to see how we've been living, to see if we are growing in our faith. And Lord, if we see that we're not doing anything more than just coming to church on a Sunday and then wait until the next time we gather together and hoping that that will be enough, Lord, help us to take our spiritual lives seriously. Just as we do not eat once a week. Help us not to receive spiritual food only once a week either. So convict our hearts, Lord. Not that a year from now we can pat ourselves on the back and say, man, we did great. But that a year from now we can look back and say, what amazing growth God has given. So take us, Lord. Use us however you would like. Purify us. And make us holy. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you need to confess today that Jesus is Lord, that you believe in that foundation of this church, and you've never publicly confessed that, then I want to encourage you while we sing, come and share that with me. I would love to help you share that with this congregation. Or maybe right now you know that there's work you need to do in your life. You've been doing bare minimum and spiritually you are not where you should be. Then I encourage you, if that's where you're at, that while we sing the song, come to the altar and kneel here and pray. And for those of you, your, your knees will not allow you to get back up if you kneel here. We've got a front pew. I want to encourage you to come and sit on that front pew and, and pray there so that others may be praying for you and with you during this time. Look, none of us are where we should be. So what are we going to do to move forward? If you need to respond, now is the time. Let's stand as we sing.
about I come to you? Can I come to you? All right, he's going to come. David asked if he could uh, say a word of appreciation uh, to the people that are here. He's been dealing with some illness, and I am grabbing the usher mic here so that he can use. I'll hold this for you. Would that be all right, brother? All right. Dear Heavenly Church, thank you for my prayers. You hear my shoulders. But one thing, I have no home to go to. I have no group home to go to. I'm going to, sorry, I'm going to hell today. I need everybody's prayer so I can find me a home so I don't have to stay in the no for the rest of my life. Well, David wanted to say thank you for the prayers that you've been giving as he's been, been healing and, and living in different homes. But let's take just a moment right now. He's trying to find a, a, a permanent place to live that, that can show him love and compassion. So let's just take a moment before the benediction. And can we pray for you right now, David? Would that be all right? As a church, let's do that. Father God, not one of us in this room can fully know the pain and anguish that David has been through and, and the different living environments that he's had to deal with. But right now, Father, we ask for a couple of things. We ask that you continue to heal his body. But Father, we also pray that you would give him a peace and a comfort that can only be explained by the Holy Spirit. Help him to know that you love him even when it seems like no one else does. And I pray, Father, that, and I pray, Father, just, that you would just give him the courage to face another day. Help us to love him well. For we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. You can walk with me, brother. Let's do that. Brothers and sisters, none of us want to waste our lives. But a life glorifying God, which in any way that we can, is not a life wasted. So let us glorify him well. Let's receive the benediction together as one family. Almighty God maker of heaven and earth. We give you praise for what you have done. And we ask, Lord, that you would give us willing feet to follow in obedience to the things that you have called us to do. And now, Father, as we leave this place, guard our hearts and our minds by granting us your peace. Amen. Amen.